So a very good afternoon to you all. I'm uh, delighted uh, that so many of you have been able to uh, join this relatively brief um, uh, webinar, but uh, brief as it may be, I think it's uh, um, an issue which is uh, um, of significant concern to the childcare um, sector. Um, and particularly at a point in time when there are so many questions coming up about what uh, the future of the childcare sector is going to look like uh, for the next five or 10 years with the independent uh, review of children's social care. Um, I've been working in the, uh, in the well, I've been working at uh, BAF and then Core and BAF since 2000. Uh, and prior to that, um, I was at uh, College, which is one of the uh, colleges of the University of London, I was um, head of the social work uh, programmes. Um, and uh, the issue of permanence, uh, when we were um, designing some of um, the uh, programmes that we were uh, delivering, um, centred quite significantly on the um, evolution and development of the concept of uh, permanence when it came to both what children uh, needed um, and what the sector needed to focus on um, in the work that it actually uh, did. Um, and uh, over, over that time, uh, there have been huge developments in all kinds of um, uh, different ways um, in trying to improve what we do, how we do it, how we're organized, what resources we have, uh, what, what uh, the priorities actually are. And of course, we've um, just uh, seen one of the uh, 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 biggest recent developments, not, not just with the care review, but with the um, Department for Education's uh, national um, adoption strategy. Um, so I thought that this was a, a good opportunity um, just to review something of the history of these issues and some of the things that really stand have always stood out for me as being um, hugely significant, you know, with some um, significant questions, I think, also to be um, asked um, particularly at the end of uh, this um, heading, are we on track? Because I, I think I feel quite concerned about um, some of the statistics and some of the data, which suggests um, that there are certainly potentially troubling things um, happening at the moment. And um, I, would, I would like to think that we could um, get to grips with some of that. Um, and your views on that um, will be very um, interesting in the course of the afternoon. Um, so, Kay, if you just go to the next slide. Um, so this is the plan. Um, um, an introduction, I've done the introduction. Um, uh, the role of children in society, a, a very brief history, which um, I will uh, spend a bit of time talking about. The development and the significance of psychological parent parenting, and particularly the evolution of permanence um, as one of the key aspects of the significance of uh, psychological parenting. Um, I'm going to have just a, um, a couple of uh, breakout rooms for you to discuss some of these um, issues and with some feedback from you as well. Um, I'm then going to go on to talk about um, permanence and children's wishes and feelings. Uh, we're going to have a breakout room after that. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that I'd be very interested in hearing from you about is um, what you what you think from your experience are some of the most effective developments might uh, need to be put in place to address some of the issues that I'm actually going to uh, raise um, in my uh, in my slides. Um, so I've got something like 45 slides to get through as well. We'll send those slides um, on to you after the uh, um, uh, after the webinar is actually finished. Um, so don't worry about taking notes or what well, having to. Um, uh, record, record any of those slides because, as I said, they will be made available. Um, so, okay, if we just go to uh, the next slide. And I, I suppose one of the things throughout my career, and I, I mean, I did train as a social worker, but before that, I, I did a degree in sociology um, and to some degree anthropology, uh, where these issues about some of the fundamentals of the human species was discussed. Um, from many different uh, perspectives. Um, but some of these kind of fundamental issues about how the human race um, has had to develop ways of surviving some of the significant challenges, uh, whether they come from the environment, whether they come from other human beings, 
uh, whether they come from uh, the huge significance of us being able to uh, uh, keep ourselves alive with the food that we eat, um, uh, the shelter that we can seek, uh, the protection of others um, if we're under threat by whether it's other animals or the human species. So survival is a, a very key aspect um, uh, to that. Adaptability, um, we often find ourselves in circumstances that uh, we wouldn't have uh, predicted or that are new to us and our capacity to kind of learn and develop um, approaches to whatever those issues are, are absolutely fundamental both to our survival um, and our um, continuing uh, place on the uh, planet. Um, and uh, we can break some of those issues up when it comes to um, us as individuals, um, our capacity and competence both to survive and adapt and how we do that on a 24-7 uh, basis. Um, but of course, there are also um, um, the environmental uh, factors and, uh, um, well, I don't think that we can ignore at all the fact that uh, the, the environmental factors that are currently um, uh, uh, are a threat to our survival and um, the importance of us adapting uh, to those environmental uh, threats um, is hugely um, significant. Um, <laughs> if we go to the next slide. Um, and I suppose some of the things about uh, that, that those fundamentals of the human species and our capacity to survive and adapt um, is that they are hugely related um, to our individual capacity to bond and form social groups. And um, I suppose the first that we would mark out as being significant um, in relation to that is um, the social group, which is the family. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the relational world that is created by um, the birth parents with their children and a wider range of other people, you know, couldn't be more significant, both in terms of helping ch children to uh, learn how to adapt, um, how to help them on an individual basis um, uh, survive, um, how they develop the capacity to change um, when they come across new sets of circumstances and to be able to respond in a positive way. Um, and helpful way. Um, the way that we um, develop the capacity um, to embed what we learn in social groups, um, you know, so whether that's, well, as is uh, very significant at the moment, um, uh, whether that's football, um, uh, 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 whether that's uh, playing music, um, whether that's the job that we actually do, um, and a, a very significant part of that is also our capacity to teach and learn from others. Um, and I, I, for me, the, the, these strike me as so, such kind of fundamental issues when we're thinking about kind of human development and uh, the things that actually matter in human development, um, that they must, they must also be very actively, I think, taken into account when it comes to um, the design and delivery of children's social care, um, because the duties and responsibilities um, of us as social workers uh, and others um, are, are trying to address um, how do we get children back on track when uh, some of these issues do not work out and they go fundamentally um, off track and uh, with significant um, either threat to um, or risk to um, the child um, themselves. So we go on to the next one, Kay. Um, and I, I suppose, that, again, I, I think it's probably true in social work that we've, you know, we recognise that children are absolutely dependent on their <coughs> parents, particularly um, at birth, and for the, uh, for the first three to five years, um, they uh, grow to um, be able to make decisions themselves or look after themselves in different kinds of ways over that time. Um, but they do need the uh, resources, whether that's within the relational world, within the family world in which, which they live, or whether that's external um, uh, resources from other family members or places like school or health or whatever. Um, so there, there is this list of people, um, I think, which are who are absolutely kind of fundamental to um, the child, uh, both learning from and being able to turn to uh, when the going gets tough for them. So their parental figures, um, their family, and particularly their, so I just go back uh, there, if we could, you yeah, know, that's going forward rather than backwards. Um, uh, their family, um, you know, both uh, their parents as, as well as the extended family member, 
to the community that they're uh, living in. And we've got that uh, well-known phrase, um, it takes uh, a village to raise a child and of course society at, um, at large and the way that it comes to kind of recognize and acknowledge um, all of these issues um, as it develops and delivers um, uh, policy of all um, different kinds. So go to the next one. So whether that's dependency in relation to security and protection from danger, and of course we're very familiar with that when it comes to children's social care, when it comes to the kind of the, um, uh, the fundamental issue about feeding, protection from infection. Um, of course, we've seen that uh, hugely amplified by um, uh, COVID, but uh, it's a fundamental issue when it comes to the human uh, species um, in general, that uh, uh, the threats from being infected from a whole series of um, uh, viruses and bacteria are hugely significant. Temper temperature regulation, keeping ourselves reasonably warm, of course that's under threat, some threat certainly into uh, the future with all that's going on in terms of fuel and en energy. Uh, and also the importance of um, uh, an individual child being stimulated, typically through play, um, typically starts off with parents and of course there are going to be a whole range of different people uh, whether it's teachers at school, sports coaches, music coaches, ballet dancing, um, or other children, um, that will be a very significant part of creating that um, stimulating um, environment. Next one, Kay. Well, as we know, dependency changes over time, that it's very different from a six-month-old um, uh, child to a six-year-old six, six child to a 16-year-old child to a 60-year-old adult. Um, you know, that as um, uh, any individual um, increases their capacity and competence to take charge and manage the things that uh, they have to manage uh, on each individual day, um, that it, it fundamentally changes the nature of who they actually are. But I suppose one of the things that uh, I would absolutely kind of emphasize at the center of that is that um, relationships and the relational world that we all live in is absolutely at the center um, of the development of that capacity. Um, and uh, we are primarily, um, as human beings, relational in a way that most other species are not. That, and that's not to say that they are. We know that um, animals lives in, live in herds, they can protect one another, they can keep one another um, safe, um, they can um, uh, do all kinds of things which are you know, definitely a part of the kind of herd immunity. Um, but uh, the, the detail and quality of what we are able to do um, you know, is, is, I think, uh, fundamentally um, uh, related to the relational world that we uh, discover as we um, are born into this world and develop um, into who we actually become. So the next one. <laughs> and you know, it's the life cycle that um, constructs all of that. It both constructs, explains, and explores the development of the individual over time from cradle to grave, um, the changes that take place and the significant influences that determine this. So as I said, whether we're talking about early childhood, middle childhood, adolescence, um, early adulthood, middle adulthood, later adulthood, um, that, that all of those issues in themselves will re re uh, raise significant questions. Um, and I think one of the fundamental issues for social workers as a profession, you know, whatever specific part of the social work profession you are actually in, is that uh, we uh, continuously find ourselves um, interve intervening in that life, life cycle in a way that um, is hugely significant to the individual. And, uh, we, you know, with the primary um, duty and responsibility to enhance that individual's welfare and well-being, whatever that actually means um, when it comes to um, uh, the life cycle uh, for that, uh, uh, that child, um, adolescent or adult. Or adult. <coughs> so if we just go to the next one. Um, you may have some views about that, um, and, and it would be very interesting to discuss it, but given our limited time, um, I just wanted to move on to um, uh, the second part of um, uh, my introduction, uh, which is a brief history of um, children when it comes to uh, some of these um, issues. Um, and I think the first thing is, you know, for many, many, many generations, um, the position of children's society um, has left them um, in the hands of their parents, whatever the consequences. Um, so all the things that we've come to know and um, significantly value, ch keeping children safe, uh, maintaining their life 
um, providing them with what they actually need um, do not come across so um, strongly when families have got themselves into difficulties in the past um, because society was not on the side of um, recognizing that uh, parents have a duty and responsibility to their children rather than kind of uh, children have a duty and responsibility to be good children for their parents. Uh, so although um, over um, history uh, in Europe particularly, um, we've seen various versions of the poor law, which is often, uh, was often uh, relig religious, um, religion based, uh, that, they, that that poor law did provide some support for families. It was often in uh, institutions of various kinds, particularly workhouses, where the moral standing of the family, what they actually came to receive, um, and what the, indeed the children received as a result were of huge um, significant, uh, significance. And um, I think some of that is summed up in um, the, uh, um, the novel by Dickens, Oliver Twist, uh, where he finds himself in a, in a, a, um, a workhouse um, uh, fed on gruel um, um, every, every single day um, and he goes up to the person that's actually uh, distributing that gruel and actually says you know which was absolutely not allowed please sir uh, I want some more he was hungry um, ne next slide uh, so the person the master um, who had the ladle and was distributing that gruel um, actually said uh, to him uh, what uh, the faint voice <coughs> Um, and he said, please, sir, I want some more. Um, that resulted in the master aiming a blow at Oliver's head with the ladle. Uh, he pinioned um, Oliver in his arm and shrieked aloud for the beadle. That would have been the more senior person um, who would have come in uh, to actually address um, that um, evolving uh, crisis because Oliver wanted a bit more um, of the gruel um, because he was hungry. Um, and I think that that does um, sum up, um, you know, much of the kind of picture that um, uh, we have a, a strong kind of sense of when it came to what happened in Victoria time, in Victorian times, that, um, you know, children um, uh, were there um, to be on the receiving end what, of what adults morally um, and socially thought that they deserved. Um, and uh, the one thing that children were not allowed to do was um, uh, to try to ask for more or to be seen in a different kind of way. So if we go to the next one. So th this became, uh, this is a specific um, uh, case from the uh, early 19, well, the Second World War, 1940s. Um, so it, it, it's significant in that it changed the law. Uh, so it, it concerns a 12 year old boy called Dennis O'Neill, um, who was placed with his brother, Terence, um, in foster care uh, by Newport um, Council in May 19, 44, and they were placed with those foster carers, um, having been identified as in need of care and attention. Uh, so placed in 1944, uh, May 1944, and in January 1945, uh, Dennis died at the hands of his foster parents, um, who were called uh, Reginald and Esther Gow. Um, they uh, ran a farm um, in Wales. Um, and uh, um, the, there were multiple injuries um, and uh, serious neglect uh, found for both boys. But as I said, Dennis um, actually died as a result of uh, those multiple injuries and serious neglect. So the next one. Okay, so there was, there was a criminal trial. Um, so uh, the foster father was actually um, charged with um, manslaughter. Uh, not murder, manslaughter, um, and Terence, his brother, testified that they were fed three slices of bread and butter a day plus tea, their only food. Um, uh, Terence said that he and Dennis um, stole whatever they could from the pantry. Uh, Dennis himself would suck milk from the teats of cows, um, and every night both boys were thrashed on their hands and or legs with up to 100 blows um, each. We'll go to the next one. Um, I mean, the, the, the detail of it is, and well, even just in those few words, is you know, it is horrific, and um, uh, and, it, it, and it's almost kind of unimaginable, except that we know it's also very kind of familiar with what children, um, some children experience today. 
Um, but anyway, the thing that it actually did is that um, it part that the um, there was a law that was passed um, that set up what was called a boarding out committee. I, I think the boarding out thing was kind of drawing on the kind of institutional um, perspective that a society had about what children need. They needed to be boarded out as they would be in a school. Um, and what that uh, committee was required to do uh, was uh, appoint an official who was required to visit every foster child within a month of their being placed at least uh, once every six weeks. They were required to submit a written report taking into account any complaint made by the child. So, so it's the, the evolution of a, a kind of system that um, placed the child at the centre, um, uh, saw uh, child protection um, as being a very significant part of the duties and responsibilities of that official. Um, and that included appointing a doctor uh, for every uh, foster child um, who was to examine the child within one month of their being placed and at least once a year. Uh, so there's something familiar in, in all of that. But as I said, it goes back uh, specifically to the Act, uh, the 48 Act that was um, passed um, as a result of the, um, the issues, the specific issues raised by uh, Dennis O'Neill. So we go to the next one. Um, and then uh, now this this one um, was was uh, this was a time that I was around as a social worker, uh, Maria Colwell. Uh, she was born on the 26th of March 1965, and uh, died in January 1973. She was killed by her stepfather William Keppel, um, and she came into care. Uh, no, um, sorry, she, when she was a few months old, her, fa her father, uh, Raymond Colwell, uh, died, and uh, uh, so her and her sisters were placed in foster care. Um, after three months, she was placed with her aunt and uncle, Doris and Bob Cooper, <coughs> and the evidence was that Maria was said to be very happy and well looked after. New one. Next one. Um, at age six, um, she left. Uh, that placement and returned to live with her biological mother, Pauline Keppel, and her partner, William Keppel. And on the 6th of January uh, 1973, William Keppel physically assaulted Maria, leaving her with severe internal external injuries. And the following morning, um, he wheeled her um, in a pram uh, to the Royal Sussex County Hospital, where she died shortly after um, arrival. The next one. Um, and I, th I, as I said, that 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 case, because there was a very very significant inquiry uh, that was um, um, undertaken into the role of social workers, <coughs> um, the awareness of risk, um, contact with Maria herself, particularly um, herself as a child, um, that had, had really allowed this situation to evolve, and um, you know, which resulted in her death. Um, but the, uh, at the same time, there was a kind of an increasing um, recognition. There was a very uh, famous paper um, published in the, uh, in the USA, uh, which identified the significance of something they called the battered baby syndrome. Um, and it was quite controversial at that time um, in kind of trying to name something uh, where um, babies were put at risk um, and at significant risk uh, from their parents um, as a result of, um, uh, of maltreatment. We started then to see through the 1970s um, an escalation in the uh, degree of awareness that uh, we had about um, uh, the threats and risk that uh, children uh, could be um, subject to, whether that was physical um, abuse and neglect. Um, in the 1980s, we uh, discovered, um, uh, uh, and it was acknowledged uh, about sexual child abuse, emotional child abuse in the 1990s, neglect more specifically in the 1990s, and uh, domestic abuse. Uh, so I think this huge evolution of the fact that um, um, uh, that parents or other adults um, uh, could be of significant uh, risk uh, really then developed uh, in a very significant way a child protection system, um, which in many ways was designed to be robust, um, thoughtful and evidence-based. Uh, but time and time again, there were these individual cases that um, indicated that uh, uh, there was an awful lot more that needed to be done to protect these children from really the most unbelievably dreadful of co uh, dreadful um, set of consequences. Uh, so the next one. <coughs> so um, <coughs> one of the things that became a part of um, that um, was the development of this concept of psychological parenting. Um, and that was set out um, 
in a book uh, published in the 1970s uh, by uh, Goldstein, Freud and Solnit. Um, uh, there's one psychiatrist, um, psychotherapist, Anna Freud, who was uh, Sigmund Freud's um, daughter, and Solnit, um, uh, who was a judge. Um, and this comes from their book. From a child's perspective, it is their psychological parent who is key to their development, not their biological parent, unless the two are the same person or the same people. Um, and of course, it, for most children, that's going to be the case, that their biological parents are also uh, their psychological parents. And I think that much of that has been reinforced through the concept of um, attachment and particularly um, some of the later uh, developments of, um, of attachment, that the child's subjective experience of um, their parent as being a secure base, a safe base, a responsive base, um, uh, 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 creates this kind of this very fundamental issue about um, the, the child's subjective experience identifying very, very quickly um, who their psychological parent actually um, is. So we go on to the next one. Um, and so their argument was, um, and this became hugely significant in the USA. Um, so they said, whenever a court is deciding on the future custody or placement of a child, the decision should be driven by the significance of the psychological parent, not the biological parent to the child. It is the child's subjective experience with their, within their own time frame that should be the dominant factor in the court's decision about the future of the child. So it's a very, very child-focused, uh, very child-centered perspective. Um, and um, unusually, um, it places um, uh, the welfare, safety, and development of the child at the center um, of the way that the system should operate, uh, rather than being secondary to whatever the parent themselves decides that they want and need. Uh, and this did um, result in the development of legislation across um, the states, although individual states had different ways of um, defining this. Um, so uh, largely the, 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 the um, Adoption and Safeguarding um, Act in, in America actually says that if a child has been in care for 17 weeks or more, um, for, sorry, for 17 of the last 24 weeks, uh, then the court uh, will make an adoption order just on the basis of that time scale. Um, uh, uh, you know, which is very different to um, us having to uh, um, uh, present evidence when it comes to um, um, significant harm and all the other issues that are set out, set out both in the 69 Act and the 2002 Act. Um, but I, th I think it's, uh, it, it's a very interesting development about sort of how we've moved or how society more generally has kind of moved into recognizing our duties and responsibilities to children, rather than kind of saying that, uh, you know, the first thing that we must pay attention to is the duties and rights of the parents. Uh, there's a lot to discuss about all of this, and we won't have specific time to do it but, in this afternoon, but I do think it's a very, very important um, thing for us to um, engage um, in doing. Uh, the next one. <sighs> okay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to run through some of the issues about um, permanence and psychological parenting in uh, some of the other slides. There was just, there's one um, uh, book that, um, uh, that was, was published in 1989. It was uh, uh, a part of a series of books published by BAF um, at that time. Um, and it was a piece of work um, undertaken by Rowe. Um, and the title of the book is Child Care Now, a Survey of Placement Patterns. We'll go to the next uh, slide. So this is a summary of what um, Hundleby actually found. So she said, regardless of placement, so wh wherever the child was placed, <coughs> most children are discharged within six months, mostly back home, and a minority remain in care for more than two years. In spite of other variations amongst local authorities, social workers' expectations for the length of placement were remarkably uniform. Fewer than one in five placements um, uh, ended because of behaviour problems on the part of the child, other than that, uh, children placed home on trial, placements with the purpose of assessment or treatment were less likely to be regarded um, as successful. So she, in her, this um, piece of research, she started to identify, you know, what, what were the drivers when it came to how, how a plan was actually made uh, for the child that was in their best interests um, and dealt with these uh, primary issues about safety, welfare and um, development. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, 
Um, some of the things she said, she said that local it wasn't related to local authorities or organizational structure. Um, Long-term fostering tended to be for adolescents who first came into care when they were much younger. Although residential care was rated by social workers as less successful, um, few differences were found between residential placements and foster care overall. M and residential care at that time, you know, at the um, around the beginning, well, before and into the early 80s, uh, was um, uh, was designed on a much uh, different basis to generally what we uh, think of as being residential care now. Um, next one, okay. Um, and she she came up with this uh, this uh, graph called the leaving care cave. Uh, leaving, leaving care curve by age. So what this actually shows that it is if, um, so you've got children here, uh, different lines, depending on whether they're not to four, five to 10, 11 to 13, 14 to 15, or 16 uh, plus. But whatever their age, um, if they hadn't left care by um, the, uh, after, before they'd reached 22 weeks in care, the likelihood of them staying in care uh, for uh, the next 115 weeks um, increased dramatically. Um, so this graph um, then became ter termed uh, drift in care. Um, were, were those children who didn't return home after 20 or so weeks, um, did they have a proactive, child-centered, child-driven uh, care plan and arrangement whether that was in foster care, maybe in residential care, that focused on some of the issues that I was talking about um, earlier. So that term drift in care um, became quite a significant challenge to the child placement uh, sector. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so the conclusion of that review was that a child looked after for more than six months has a 60% chance of remaining in care for four years or more. A child looked after for more than 12 months as an 80% chance of uh, remaining in care for four years or more. And the next slide. So, so they were some of the drivers in uh, the evolution of uh, policy and uh, practice um, uh, when it came to um, what should we be focusing on, what should we prioritize when it comes to um, those groups of children. <coughs> It's where permanency planning comes in and we have this definition a proactive process that enables a child to experience in an ongoing way a primary and meaningful relationship with a psychological parent where this is legally secure for most children this will be with their birth parents and i just i think that issue about a primary and meaningful relationship with a psychological parent where that is legally secure um i think that still continues to be what is at the heart of permanency planning. Where a birth parent cannot be a psychological parent um, or helped to become one, so that's part of our duties and responsibilities about trying to um, intervene and uh, work with the birth parent or birth parents um, to actually take on that um, psychological parenting role. Um, uh, uh, that that, that um, uh, it must be the primary focus of our intervention when it comes to the kind of future of the child. Um, and that must be based on the child psychosocial um, timescale. Uh, so waiting, or wait, 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 as it's sometimes been called, um, is, um, is not in the best interest of the child and that um, our plans and our permanence plans have to be driven by the fact that, um, you know, that overall there is a significant um, risk for the child uh, the longer they wait for that care plan to be actually agreed, um, authorised and put into action. Okay, the next one, Claire. Um, and then we've got these three core aspects of permanence. Um, uh, so the issue about legal permanence and uh, our law sets out, um, uh, uh, you know, both in, in adoption and uh, uh, special guardianship, um, uh, where parental responsibility is then handed over to either adopters um, or it's, it, it's uh, with special guardianship, it's um, exercised by uh, the person holding the special guardianship order to the um, uh, exception of um, anybody else that might have held uh, parental uh, responsibility. Psychosocial permanence, so that's the issue about the child's direct um, subjective experience about who um, those people actually are 
uh, the secure base, um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the warmth, sensitivity, uh, devotion, love of the parents. And of course, the physical and environmental permanence, I mean, typically associated with home and community, uh, but something that uh, we often see as being uh, significantly disrupted um, when children move from foster care placement to foster care placement, or foster care placement to residential placement, residential placement to uh, independent, uh, semi-independent care um, arrangements. Uh, so we've got